Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online with our entire back catalog at rce-cast.com. Uh, also, again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Yeah, actually, it's been a, it's been a good week here at OpenMPI. We just... Uh I know this will go out in a couple of days, but uh, we just released OpenMPI 1.7.5 yesterday, so feeling pretty good today. Also, I'm going to be hosting at the University of Michigan an Exceed workshop, which is open to anybody, uh, you know, Exceed Award, U of M student or not, uh, for Open AAC. So those of you guys who are interested in programming GPUs, Xeon 5s, or just learning uh, different pragmas, go ahead and check us out. It's um, April 1st, so it's kind of short notice, but go to exceed.org, and it's X-S-D-E, um, to check it out. So that's the Open Accelerator uh, workshop. Okay, so today our guests are... Uh, Greg de Konersberg and I'm um, uh, Greg. You're gonna have to correct me on that. Oh yeah, happy to. <laughs> Vic, yeah, yeah. And Vic Iglesias, and they're here to talk about eucalyptus. So, uh, guys, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, Vic, you want to start, or should I start? Uh, my name is uh, Vic Iglesias. I'm the director of quality and release at Eucalyptus Systems. So I battle uh, with myself to make sure the code is as good as it can be and right on time. Uh, my name is Greg de Kernigsberg. I'm the, the community for Eucalyptus, so uh, uh, I care about making sure we're building the right product and uh, making sure the open source community uh, is a part of that process. So, uh, you know, our, our focus tends to be you know, high-performance computing, scientific computing, so a lot of our listeners probably haven't heard of Eucalyptus. So why don't you guys give us an idea of what is Eucalyptus? What is eucalyptus? Uh, so uh, eucalyptus is an acronym. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. And it stands for Elastic Utility Computing Architecture, linking your programs to useful systems, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's the Elastic Utility Computing Architecture. That's the key there. We're basically uh, open source infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, and we do our very best to keep uh, high fidelity with the Amazon Web Services API. So the idea is that if you want your own private cloud and you want it to be highly AWS compatible, we're the guys you come to. Now, how did you guys get started? Because, you know, clouds are all the rage these days, but you seem to have a very particular spin on doing private clouds, being AWS compatible and so on. So how did this, how did this start? Oh, let's see. I guess it was a research project at uh, UCSB in uh, 2000, what, nine, eight, Vic, yeah. you know? Yep. yep, that's right, 2008. Uh, and it was a bunch of, uh, uh, it was a professor, Rich Wolski, at University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and his seven Mary graduate students. Uh, and they wanted to set up their own uh, version of the uh, Amazon Web Services Cloud that they could use for their own research and their fellow researchers. So it sort of uh, came out of uh, uh, needs in academia. Uh, and they turned around a, a version 1.0 pretty quickly that was a fair facsimile of uh, uh, some of the more basic functions of AWS. Uh, and then they realized, hey, there are a lot of people who might need this. Uh, and so it sort of turned into a company from there. And uh, here we are still plugging. Yep. So uh, around that idea, um, there was already, as you said, AWS already existed. So there was public offerings. What, what's the real, what was their driver for wanting to build a, a private cloud and why do you see people building private cloud now? Uh, I think I could take this one. So, you know, the, the university has certain amount of hardware allocated for these projects and they receive that hardware and weren't given extra money to run stuff in the public cloud. So they had to utilize that as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, so I think, I think that was a big driver for them uh, writing the software. Uh, and we see similar ideas still where a lot of companies and users have hardware laying around and they can utilize those cores and that RAM and that storage that they have there to run a workload. Whether it or not it's all of their workload uh, is irrelevant. They get to leverage the things that they have purchased in the past 
in order to run uh, their current workloads. And with Eucalyptus, you can use any tooling that you had existing uh, for running against AWS. Or if you want to pick up a new tool off the shelf that was written for AWS, you can point it at Eucalyptus and use it uh, equally. Do you see many customers coming to you guys or people on the on the open source portion of the mailing list uh, coming to you because they're concerned about putting that much of their infrastructure into hands of a third party? Uh, I, I haven't seen that concern. Usually, you know, we have a lot of land and expand type of installations um, where people will start with uh, a cloud in a box, which is, you know, one single node and run Eucalyptus on it, poke around with it, and then uh, add additional compute nodes to it. Uh, so there, there is the, the possibility to scale this thing uh, at, at pretty small and, and large scale. Yeah, I don't think people, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to tell people's motivations, right? They, there are a bunch of possible motivations for private cloud. There's regulatory, uh, you know, uh, the, for whatever reason, they can't put their data into a public service. Uh, there's cost considerations, uh, I don't think that, you know, I think whenever you basically use any uh, ISP or service provider of any kind, you are, quote unquote, putting your data in someone else's hands, right? So it's just a different kind of hosting model in that way. Um, uh, but I think that what people do want is the same kind of self-service that AWS provides. They want that inside of their own organizations more than anything else, right? The um, there's a, there's a story I tell called the sysadmin's lament, right? The sysadmin sort of has this fiefdom, has control over these resources. If you want a system, you have to fill out a form. It goes through a process. The sysadmin basically puts up these kinds of walls uh, to make sure that they can manage the complexity of, of making sure that everyone has compute power. Well, the sysadmin starts having a problem when the, uh, the end user, rather than having to go to the sysadmin, can just take a credit card out of their wallet and go get uh, a, a, a test bed server at AWS. And now that that is reality, sysadmins in the real world are having to sort of scramble and say, oh, well, you know, uh, how do we compete with that? And so uh, providing the same kind of self-service capability in a private cloud uh, is something that's, uh, you know, organizations re- recognize that they need now. And, and there are, you know, lots of ways to do it. Okay, now part of the value add here, of course, like we said multiple times, is is the ability, the compatibility with AWS. And you you said uh, a very interesting thing a moment ago that you can take any tool that is created for AWS and just point it at Eucalyptus and be good to go. Tell me a little bit about how that works. Um, like, let, let's say I go buy this package and it says, oh, you can run your services out on AWS. Is there some central? Eucalyptus server that I have on premises that I just changed some server name in the package and I'm good to go. Right. In essence, you just you know what we do is we we try to mirror the the API and its semantics. Uh, so we use all the you know SDKs and a lot of tools to verify that that functionality. Uh, once you have one of these tools, you would change you know in, in most cases it's it's presented as an endpoint, and you would change the endpoint URL uh, to point at your Eucalyptus installation and start plugging away. All right. Now, with the Eucalyptus infrastructure, does that allow me to overflow to AWS if I need to? Like, you know, I I have 100 resources and I have 150 requests. And so my 100 resources are full. Can it spill over those extra 50 into AWS, that kind of thing? That is the the dream called hybrid cloud. Uh, And I think that everyone is sprinting to get to that same place. Uh, you can do that today. There are some caveats. There are things that you have to do correctly, right? You need to make sure, for instance, uh, that you've got images that are identical that are running in both places. Uh, and you have to make sure that uh, you're using the same subset of services that Eucalyptus supports, right? Uh, AWS has 40-plus uh, services uh, out there, and we support seven of them. We support EC2, S3, IAM, uh, 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 ELB, ED. auto scanning. Vic, can you rattle off the others? Yeah, uh, ELB, auto scaling, and CloudWatch are the the last three that we added. Right. Hey, can so, you can you give us the one sentence description of of what each of those are? Because some of our listeners might not be familiar with them. Sure. Take a crack at that. Yeah. <laughs> 
So EC2 is is what you would generally think of as the the compute side of the house. Um, so that's spinning up virtual machines, um, attaching volumes, which are you know your block device to those uh, virtual machines. Uh, S3 is your object storage, uh, where you would put your files, your images, your data that you want to grab as whole files rather than as blocks. Uh, IAM is the uh, identity and access management which uh, goes across all the services. That's how we manage accounts and users and policies and all those kinds of things. Uh, ELB is your elastic load balancer. That basically allows you to spin up instances and associate them with uh, a load balancer automatically. Auto scaling is the ability to use triggers to scale a group of instances that are equivalent, uh, you know, a cluster, uh, maybe in your guys' parlance, uh, that will scale up and down based on certain criteria. Uh, it could be CPU usage, it could be disk usage, uh, anything like that, and you can scale up and down programmatically. Uh, CloudWatch is the service that monitors your instances in order to um, uh, provide a, uh, a data point for auto-scaling and or uh, it's, pos it's also possible that you just want to use it to monitor uh, a group of instances to see trends over time. Okay, so you're doing this uh, AWS compatibility. Is this kind of being done in a black box? Uh, it's, is Amazon, do you have a, what's, what is Eucalyptus's as an organization's relationship with Amazon? Are they kind of promoting this idea of having, you know, some local, some public, or, uh, you know, or do they kind of not care? Like, what's, what's kind of their take on this? Yeah, it's completely orthogonal to Amazon. Uh, you know, there's a, we have a relationship uh, with Amazon at sort of a high level, uh, you know, that allows us to explore some uh, business opportunities together. Uh, but the code is open source. Uh, you know, we've been basically writing a completely reverse engineered uh, application stack based on the API itself uh, since we started, right? So... Uh, and, and, you know, we don't share any code. We don't, uh, share any development resources in that way. So it's, uh, it's completely engineered from the ground up based on the APIs. So now you say it's orthogonal, but I mean, how much do they care? Do they see you as a competitor and is there ever a, a threat someday of doing an Oracle Java like thing? Like, Oh, you're using our APIs, so you're infringing on our copyright, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I'm not a lawyer, and you'd have to ask Amazon that question, not us, uh, for, for the Amazon perspective. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, you know, we have every right to, uh, to uh, write code based on their API. Uh, current legal precedent upholds that right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's likely that if there's any patent war to be had in this space, there's plenty of opportunities for that kind of shenanigans completely outside of the API itself, right? The API is probably the last place where someone is going to throw up some kind of lawsuit if a lawsuit is to be had. But again, consult your own counsel. Okay, so right now you guys are based around the AWS APIs and being able to be compatible with them. Do you plan to support like OpenStack or any of the other kind of uh, you know VMware service or anything like that to be compatible with tools that use those APIs? We have a, a very base level compatibility with VMware, uh, but really AWS is our focus and will be for this foreseeable future. It's uh, so uh, obviously the dominant cloud uh, provider. If you've uh, looked at the, for instance, the Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, for public cloud. AWS is farther up and to the right than any entity I've ever seen on any uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant, right? They completely dominate the space. And so there's nothing in the eucalyptus architecture that precludes pursuing other APIs at some point. Uh, but we think the, the most important thing is to be the very best at one thing first, and that one thing is the AWS API. What are some common scenarios that your customers uh, come at you with? You, you mentioned the um, – I, I love the phrase you used earlier. What was it? Uh, land and expand? Um, but it, what is driving this? Is it is it the stuff that you cited earlier, such as regulatory, or is it people just experimenting with consolidating IT resources, 
or I mean, why do you see customers exploring the, the private cloud space? Well, I, you know, I, I think there's there's a there's myriad reasons why people do this, and and you know, the, the market is still forming itself around different use cases. But one of the ones that we see a lot of is continuous integration. Um, this is kind of an engine that drives software development, right? So you have a a, a fleet of servers that come up and down you know, hundreds or thousands of times each day in order to test a piece of software. And having that process go through, uh, you know, a, a manual uh, process where people are creating VMs slows everything down. If you slow down the testing process, you slow down the software development, you don't ship as quickly. Um, so that's one of the big uh, drivers we've seen for private cloud. Uh, this also, pr- you know, provides data locality. Um, you have your own repos locally and all that stuff and your own, you know, corporate resources that you can access. So w- let's, let's talk about the technology a little bit, how you actually do this. Like, um, what is, like, what's the architecture of Eucalyptus if I'm setting this up? Like, what's the minimum number of machines I kind of need to get going? What do I need to be familiar with? And, you know, let, let's assume I just, kind of want to set up all of the seven services you guys support. Right. So, um, you know, we, we also try to be easy to use uh, as well and kind of come up out of the box with uh, a lot of functionality. So the minimum footprint is one machine. Uh, that machine, you know, it, it obviously if you run us in a single machine deployment, it's not going to be the most performant ever, but it does let you kick the tires. Um, so you basically install CentOS. Uh, CentOS 6.5 is, is what we currently support. Uh, on, a, on a machine, you uh, load up the eucalyptus packages, uh, configure uh, the, the config files, and start the service. And you're up and running with those seven services that I mentioned. So you, we also have an, an ISO that you can download from our website that lets you has a CentOS and all the packages in there and a, a workflow for, for configuration that should get you up and running in half an hour. Now, what kind of software pieces are, are in there? Are you reusing any you know, notable open source packages inside, or is this all oh, yeah. from scratch, or, or what are you doing? Yeah, we're, we're leveraging a lot of open source uh, uh, you know, software and, and utilities uh, for uh, orchestrating the, the, the VMs. So we use uh, KVM in order to run the, the virtual machines, Libvirt, in order uh, to uh, orchestrate the, the, the creation of the process, um, in order to uh, have an uh, open source implementation of EBS, the Elastic Block Store, we use uh, TGT and iSCSI-D. Um, and then we run in uh, OpenJDK JVM for our control components. So what kind of control do I have to kind of give over to Eucalyptus? Because like if I spin up VMs, they need to be given, you know, addresses and host names. So does it need to talk, like, does it run its own DHCP and all that yes. kind of stuff too? Right. So Eucalyptus, you know, and in the Amazon model, you when you run a virtual machine, it gives you all of those things. You get IPs, your host name can be provided through the metadata service. Um, so these VMs basically configure themselves. Uh, and the way we do do that is uh, on the networking side, we're using IP tables uh, for NAT uh, and firewalling and DHCPD for the DHCPD, uh, DHCP process of the VMs. And then, how do you exactly? I'm curious how you how you do this, having just gone through an AWS workshop of oh, the uh, the ELB, the uh, load balancer. How exactly are you guys handling that? So uh, this is actually a VM that Eucalyptus spins up as kind of the system user, uh, if you will, or the administrative side of the house. Uh, it spins up a VM when you create a, lo- a load balancer, uh, and it, that VM is a prepackaged VM that uh, we created with HA proxy and some control code around it that basically hits our service API, uh, figures out which instances it should be uh, load balancing for and what configuration, and then begins load balancing for those. Now, how do you orchestrate all the networking stuff? Do you have to integrate in with the networking gear that is there, or do you just kind of assume that you're given, say, a, a giant L2 space in, in which to play and you can do whatever you want in there? Right. So it, we have, uh, in, in our older modes, we have these ma- managed modes, which basically take care of all the networking for you with the caveat that you've given us at least some L2 space uh, to, to uh, sorry, L, L3 space to uh, chunk up. Um, and that basically handles, you know, in the Amazon uh, 
uh, model, you have a private and a public address. So your private addresses end up on the uh, L3 subnet that you've handed us, and we chop that up for each security group. And then you also provide Eucalyptus with some public IPs. These public IPs are things that are routable on your current network. So what about availability, though? I mean, Amazon has the idea of different regions and availability zones. Can I use Eucalyptus and kind of set up my own, like, two split data centers and say, like, run over there, run over here, and ELB across them or that kind of deal? So currently we only support one region, uh, which is the Eucalyptus region, but you can set up multiple clouds. Uh, We don't currently have any credential federation across the clouds, uh, but what we have seen is that uh, people will use... uh, trains to come around, uh, people will use uh, a, a separate cluster in order to provide, you know, hardware availability or to just have, you know, a separate place maybe for a different hardware profile uh, where they can run their VMs. Now, I want to go back in time a little bit a second ago because I, I forgot to ask this question when you were talking about it. You said you use KVM. Are you guys looking into containers at all that are a, a feature coming up in the you know, the recent Linux kernels, or is that outside of AWS and therefore not interesting, at least at this point? Well, we, we just haven't heard uh, the customer demand and the, and the use cases around uh, containers, so we haven't invested too much time. You know, we've been tinkering, uh, as, as most people have, uh, with, with containers and Docker and, and such. Um, but we have, yeah, we haven't seen anything to drive the, the product roadmap that way. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, lose, using Libvirt, allows us to easily implement uh, using Linux containers uh, because we already have an abstraction layer above that. Okay, so what's the actual like management of this stuff look like? Uh, is it a bunch of Java things, or can those servers be federated to provide availability, or is this you know kind of a, a single service right now that then it kind of orchestrates everything? Um, so we can split out all of the components. We have uh, five main components. The cloud controller, uh, which handles kind of the uh, services, the, the web services, the, the endpoints that you hit. Uh, the cluster controller, which handles scheduling and networking. Uh, the storage controller, which handles our EBS service, you know, exporting a volume to a VM. Um, and the VMware broker, which is the, the kind of API endpoint uh, that we use to, to get to uh, v, vSphere and, and ESXi, and then the node controller. And the node controller is the machine where your uh, instances, your VMs, will run. So that's the one that's running the, the KVM hypervisor. Uh, all of the components there are uh, able to be set up in a highly available uh, situation where you have uh, a redundant component that is uh, passive uh, until it detects a failure and then comes up. Uh, so the node controllers we don't uh, have high, availab- high availability for, but we do uh, allow for uh, VM migration. So if you did have to take one out, you could migrate your VMs off of that node uh, and onto another and then take that node out of service. Now, you meant you're keep referring to KVM and open source, but you also mentioned VMware on there and ESXi and vSphere right. and stuff. So what, what exactly is going on there? Why, why both? So, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of enterprises have, you know, paid out licensing fees to VMware. Now, like we discussed earlier, I want to use my existing stuff. So we have to overlay on, on what we see customers have around. Um, and ASXi boxes uh, we use as, you know, a, a kind of node controller where we can basically spin up the, the same VM we spun up in KVM on a different VMware node. Yeah, the, the, the purpose of the VMware integration, though, is really uh, for customers who are ready to start moving from VMware to either the public cloud or their own uh, more cloud-based infrastructure. Um, you know, and, and the story really there is uh, a waypoint along the migration path, right? Uh, that's that's sort of the, the you know we're not going to be supporting deeply every uh, feature that VMware supports. I would say we have just enough VMware support to help users uh, uh, move cleanly from sort of the locked in VMware world to uh, you know uh, either their own open source private cloud uh, or uh, as a, as a waypoint towards AWS. 
Now, going back to the storage a little bit, you said, uh, you know, all kinds of – well, no, let me just ask. What kind of storage do you support, uh, particularly on the management and the, and the back-end hardware itself? Do you have uh, direct integration with specific RAID controllers, or are you just looking from the Linux file system and above? You know, what's, what's your level of integration there? We have a few different uh, options there. So, yeah, you can use a basic Linux file system. We call that the overlay driver. It's basically we're going to drop files down and then export those files. Uh, that was kind of the original design, um, you know, back in the day. Uh, just because, uh, like we said, people just want to drop this stuff, get it running on whatever box they have. Um, and that's the easiest way to do that. We also have uh, the ability to use direct attached storage. So if you, you know, mount a LUN or have a JBOD or something like that and attach it to a block device uh, on your machine, you can use that. And then we carve that up with LVM. Uh, and we also have the SAN integration. So SAN integration for NetApp, uh, EMC VNX, Equalogic. Uh, and NetApp cluster mode uh, are are the ones that we currently support. Now, what about backups? Um, so does the Eucalyptus infrastructure handle backups automatically, or is that something that goes outside of it, or what do you do? Currently, we don't do any uh, automated backups. Uh, generally, the users are, are using uh, snapshots and EBS volumes to – so EBS volumes to hold their data. That's their block device. Uh, and snapshots that uh, are a point-in-time copy of that. Uh, the snapshot actually gets stored in two places on the EBS side and in Walrus. So you have uh, redundancy there. Uh, as for the object storage, we use DRBD to replicate uh, the object store data uh, across two nodes. So actually, uh, explain what Walrus is and where that comes from. I just find it funny. Oh, so Walrus, so sorry, Walrus is our uh, S3 implementation. Um, And so S3, the the nomenclature for like a, a folder or, or anything like that in, in S3 is a bucket. Uh, and if you've seen uh, any of the memes where Walrus has my bucket, uh, that is where that comes from. Uh, and you can look that up on Google, uh, Walrus, my bucket, and uh, you'll see the pictures of a Walrus holding a bucket. And that's where that came from. Outstanding. Sounds like something that needs to go on the podcast on the, on the show page, Brock. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually kind of funny because aren't all the buckets in like var lib b u k k i t? Yep, yep. It's, yeah. it's it, it. We went for it. You know, you, you can't go halfway when you're when you're going for a meme. Nah, no, yeah. you got to own it. You got to mm-hmm. own it. Just using your marketing material sometime. Yeah, still, still there today. Five years later, six years later. So expanding on the storage stuff a little bit. So because it is like you know var lib bucket is where all these buckets are created. Um, can you have? Can I set up like? many walrus nodes and kind of just have this you know infinitely large s3 equivalent service or, or can i keep stacking more machines that export ebs volumes and when i like you know snapshot one and make a new one from that snapshot it'll do all the right things moving it between them so currently the 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 initial walrus design walrus itself was to be on a single node and then have replicated uh data that could be brought up on another node uh in 40 which uh, should be released in a month or so we have the ability to use uh, a a redesigned architecture which uses an object storage gateway now this object storage gateway becomes the endpoint for our s3 implementation and then uses a scalable backend to store the data. So the scalable backend in our case that we're supporting out of the box is going to be uh, React CS. So React CS has this ability to scale out. Um, so you just set up your React CS cluster and point Eucalyptus at it and we'll start doing all the administrative part of putting in and getting your objects out of there. Do you plan to expand and include something like Ceph and um, you know its whole yep. crush the- system and then you could also use that for block devices and everything else possibly later? Right. So the the design is is specifically in order to support these kinds of things where some, you know, back end is, uh, you know, scalable and supports the S3 API, we can interact with it. Um, so we have seen requests for Ceph uh, and Swift and others, and this the, the design is ex- explicitly in order to support those at some point. So the actual S3 service, and you're able to kind of you're able to request objects um, by HTTP, um, but you can make them public, private, um, multi-part uploads, all that stuff. Uh, are you generally supporting all that API and that capability? 
Right. And in 3.4.2, we support uh, versioning, uh, bucket logging, the, the um, ACLs and, and that kind of uh, fine grain access control uh, and no multi-part upload in 3.4.2. But in 4.0 with the object storage gateway and its redesign, we are supporting uh, additionally uh, multi-part upload. Oh, and uh, getting back to EBS and the block storage capability, um, in terms of adding capacity to you know either create more block devices or things like that, uh, what what are the options for scaling that and like adding capacity? So currently, uh, you know, we we recommend using uh, a SAN for a highly a, a system that that needs to scale. Uh, the the commodity block storage. Uh, scale out block storage options right now are not quite stable enough for us to be comfortable to put your data into it. Um, so we do uh, have you know the the NetApp cluster mode driver where that allows you to scale uh, at a at a pretty easy rate uh, by just adding more disks or you know adding another shelf to to your uh, cluster. All right, let's move on away from from storage here. Let's go into a couple other things here. Just. Random question: What's the biggest eucalyptus deployment you've seen? Um, we've seen clusters in the ten thousand core uh, range, uh, clusters and installations, and and people who run many many clusters at that scale. So, with that size of a cluster, are they mostly just using EC two, or they actually tend to use all the features? And is it generally inward facing services, or is it actually people running production public? services on these platforms uh we, we've seen in, in the, at that scale we've seen uh mostly ec2 usage uh, and and even in amazon that's 80 percent of their their uh their bill there is is ec2 um so we do expect that to be uh the main driver uh people just aren't ha- don't have yet a an application or a use case that can leverage elb they're they're working on getting it to be cloudier and you know to be able to scale horizontally rather than vertically um so i think we'll see that in in the the coming months and years um but not not quite yet do you see any hpc deployments in eucalyptus like people uh, deploying you know a bunch of ec2 nodes together and using it for actual you know compute jobs mpi jobs things like that uh, I think that we've actually got some of that going on in the uh, academic space, where, which is a, where a lot of that kind of thing tends to happen. Uh, I think uh, Indiana and Cornell are both uh, running things uh, along that line. I, I couldn't tell you any details because they sort of tell us, hey, we're running HPC. Uh, uh, you know, and they don't share a lot of details with us because they don't need to. Um, but it's a, it's a platform that's, uh, that's, that's used for those kinds of uh, – uh, application certainly. So actually, my experience uh, with uh, Eucalyptus was actually on Future Grid. They're running some Eucalyptus there. They're also running OpenStack. You know, they're a testbed platform. They run a bunch of different things there. But uh, those nodes have InfiniBand and the whole deal. Okay, keep uh, again a, a direction change. You keep talking about the open sourceness of Eucalyptus. What's the Eucalyptus community like? Um, do you actually have developers outside of your organization? Or do you just get a, a random submission of patches here and there? Or, you know, what, what's your involvement like with both the user community and the developer community? I would say, generally speaking, uh, you know, most, most of our engineering, uh, most of our product comes from internal engineering, right? So it's, uh, it's a complicated product. There's a lot uh, going on. Uh, there's a fair amount you have to know to really get into the code base. Uh, that said, we get a you know we do get patches uh, uh, you know primarily from our users uh, who have uh, particular pain points that they want to address. But uh, sort of more largely speaking, uh, our community is essentially the entire AWS community, right? We've got uh, uh, you know lots and lots of open source tools out there that work with AWS. Uh, and also uh, work with Eucalyptus, sometimes right out of the box and sometimes with minor tweaks. Uh, so, uh, you know, most of our community contributions actually come in the form of patches to various tools in the ecosystem to make sure that they work with Eucalyptus as well as they work with AWS. All right, so just out of curiosity, this is something I ask a, a lot of developers, and uh, I just love to hear the different responses and, and why. What version control system do you guys use and, and why? Git and GitHub because they're awesome. <laughs> okay. 
yeah, I think I think the the move to you know a public uh, uh, and easily used uh, Git repository was a huge uh, benefit for us, and also I think it benefited our developers to get on uh, what I like to call the the new hotness, the thing that everybody's doing uh, right now. Uh, so we're really happy with that decision to move from BZR to Git. So what are some of the challenges you see customers run into? Like, you know, they're moving to this private cloud to get the flexibility, self-provisioning, all that sort of stuff. But what's some of the problems they run into when they do this? So, you know, what you're still doing here underneath everything is you're essentially, right? And so uh, I think a lot of what we see are there are some folks out there who uh, sort of want, want to build a distributed system at scale, uh, but you still have to do a lot of the basic sort of Linux sysadmin kind of task to do that effectively, right? Um, so, you know, we see, we see a lot of folks who uh, sort of don't necessarily know how to uh, set up and maintain a distributed Linux system underneath. Uh, so that's one set of problems. Another set of problems is that once they have the private cloud, they're not always sure what to do with it, right? I think that everyone is interested in private cloud, but you really have to write applications to be, to some degree, uh, a cloud aware, right? There's, uh, you know, if you, if you look at Netflix is a great example of how to do things the cloud way. And if you've heard of their chaos monkey, for instance, uh, that's a perfect example of an organization that is really committed to doing development the cloud way. And, you know, every so often they just turn the chaos monkey out into their infrastructure and start blowing stuff away, right? They blow away instances randomly to see if uh, instances stand back up and do what they're supposed to do. That's sort of a mindset. Uh, and users have to learn that mindset to get the full uh, uh value out of, uh, you know, the elasticity that a cloud offers. Um, and so people who tend to see it as just, you know, more virtualization, they, they don't necessarily see a lot of more benefit than that, right? There's, there's things you have to do to get full value out of a cloud, and people are still learning that, I think. Here's another infrastructure and developer question. What language do you guys typically write in, or is it a smattering of different things because you're, you're spanning so many different stacks and there's different tools to use for different areas? Um, I, so we have uh, a smattering, definitely. Uh, most of the code base is written in Java, uh, and that's the, the, the control components generally. Um, and then we have the C components that are kind of the ones that orchestrate the, the, the node controller and the networking stack. Um, those are pretty lightweight in written in C. Uh, and then we have some Perl scripts, uh, some Python for, for tooling uh, as well in there. So I, I know I, I want to ask something because like, we already asked about containers and you're like, you haven't had a lot of requests for it. Have you also not had much requests for just using this for provisioning bare metal? You ever see anybody do that? Say, I want this AMI image to effectively be put directly on that hardware? I think we have seen requests for that. Uh, it, it does kind of break the, the cloudy model that, that we expect uh, for things to kind of share resources. Um, you know, basically in AWS, you have an instance type and that instance type fit, fits within a, a single node and can be pro possibly run concurrently, many of them in a, in a single node. Um, so we would, be, we would probably have a hard time kind of defining the, the type of, of a bare metal machine if there was a, a, a large uh, kind of deviance in, in, in the, the hardware profiles of each node. Um, but, you know, presumably it, it, it's possible. Um, we just haven't seen people uh, kind of go back into uh, bare metal as much. So what license do you guys distribute Eucalyptus under? Uh, Eucalyptus is distributed under the GPL v3. Okay. And, and what is your value prop? Do you guys... Are, are you the paid support? I mean, how do you, how do you exist as a company? Yeah, it's essentially uh, the same as uh, many uh, open source software companies, right? It's uh, uh, you're paying for the support model. Uh, so uh, you can get the bits for free uh, and you can uh, run Eucalyptus perfectly well uh, on your own. Uh, but when you need help, you basically buy a support contract for us. And that's a, that's a subscription. Right. So, uh, 
you know, it's, uh, you know, generally customers who pay for it are customers who, who, you know, need, they, they need both the support, right? Uh, and, and they also need an insurance policy so that they've got one through to choke if, if something, uh, goes wrong, if they, you know, if they have concerns, uh, and the more your infrastructure, the, the more an open source product sits underneath everything, the more mission critical it is and the more important it is to have someone to be able to pick up the phone and call night or day. Now, what parts do you actually support? Because you're using a, a ton of third-party software inside Eucalyptus. So how do you draw that line? Like, do you actually have to go in and fix, uh, you know, bugs inside other software packages? Oh yeah, the customer doesn't care, right? The customer, the customer is buying uh, support for the whole thing. So we have gone in and found bugs in uh, Libvirt, uh, you know, and we have both worked around those kinds of bugs and uh, sent patches for those kinds of bugs to multiple uh, projects. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the, that's the. Uh, table stakes for running uh, an open source business that relies on other open source software. You have to be conversing up and down the stack, and we are. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can people find more information about Eucalyptus, join the mailing list, and uh, download it? Well, so you can uh, go get Eucalyptus just by going to www.eucalyptus.com. And you can see all of our source code at uh, github.com slash eucalyptus. We've got uh, tons of repos out there. Uh, and the eucalyptus slash eucalyptus repo is uh, uh, the, the main product. Um, and then if you go to the uh, GitHub wiki, uh, you can see uh, uh, all the mailing lists. And uh, we hang out on uh, IRC uh, on Freenode. So it's uh, pound eucalyptus on Freenode. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. Yeah.